2001 is a hard film to decipher, especially upon first viewing. Honestly, it can be so hard to decipher that it has polarized audiences ever since its theatrical debut nearly 50 years ago. There are two types of audience members when it comes to this film. Type A and Type B. Type A turns away and dismisses it as pretentious, artful rubbish. Whereas on the other hand, Type B claim it to be the greatest science fiction film of all time. I used to be Type A. Now I am Type B. What caused the change in my perspective? Well, once I realized where Kubrick was drawing his imagery from, I found the ability to delve into the film a lot easier. The two main individuals whose imagery is drawn from are Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas, along with many others. After I deciphered 2001's imagery, I could see the whole point of the story, which quite simply, or I guess I should say quite complexly, is man's quest to find God. Before I get into the film itself, I want to provide you with a little history in science fiction film so you can hopefully appreciate what 2001 was trying to accomplish back then. In 1968, when 2001 was released, the cinematic genre of science fiction had nearly been around for five decades. The genre was not limited to outer space, as most audience members may consider it today, but rather ranged anywhere from Frankenstein to Flash Gordon Conquers the Universe. Granted, the term science fiction encompasses a wide variety today, but outer space sci-fi has its own niche in the genre. Not until the next decade would the world begin receiving outer space sci-fi films that began taking themselves seriously, considering Barbarella, starring Jane Fonda, came out a few months after 2001. With the dawn of the 70s, there came The Andromeda Strain, THX 1138, which were pioneers in the sci-fi genre that pushed the limits of what sci-fi could be, such as 2001 did. Toward the later half of the decade, audiences got Logan's Run, Star Wars, and finally, 11 years after 2001's release, moviegoers received a frightening vision, which is considered a staple among sci-fi classics, Alien. Kubrick was venturing into unknown territory, considering some of his previous work, Pass of Glory, Lolita, and Dr. Strangelove, none of which are remotely sci-fi films. Thankfully, Kubrick was one of the first to offer the audience a new opportunity to experience art like they had never had before. Keep in mind, this is all my interpretation. Kubrick left the film ambiguous so the individual could find his or her own way of discovering what his film had to offer. If you want definitive answers, I suggest you read Arthur C. Clarke's novel. I'm giving you a fair warning right now. This video will contain major spoilers to the plot and should only be watched after viewing Kubrick's film. If you haven't seen the film, Stop the video right now, go check it out, and then come right back and hit play. Now, I know you probably think I'm going to begin talking about the film with the Dawn of Man sequence. Well, you'd be wrong. There's actually a sequence before the Dawn of Man. And while I'm discussing that sequence, I want to give you a little background into Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas' thoughts and philosophies to help you better understand the rest of the movie as we go along. First I'll begin with a verse from Isaiah from the Old Testament that perfectly embodies the film and puts it into perspective. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times and what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. Isaiah is proclaiming God's words to the people. Isaiah is known as one of the Old Testament prophets who foretold the coming Messiah. Later, Jesus fulfilled all of Isaiah's prophecies that spoke of him. This verse translates perfectly into 2001, especially the beginning and end sequences of the film. Starting with the first part of the verse, I make known the end from the beginning. This corresponds with the beginning of 2001, and will later tie back to the end of the film. First, there is only darkness then to embody Genesis 1, 1, and 2. Overlaying the darkness are discompobulated sounds of instruments keeping the viewer's imagination wondering what could possibly be happening.
Music plays a vital role in order to express a higher understanding than what humans can put into words. Listening to this music recalls J.R.R. Tolkien's The Silmarillion, where when the anur, like unto harps and lutes, and pipes and trumpets and viols and organs, a sound arose of endless interchanging melodies. Behold your music. And he showed to them a vision, giving to them sight where before was only hearing, and they saw a new world made visible before them. In 2001, after the mix of instruments overlaid in the darkness, shapes begin to come into view, and once they do, ordered music arranges the world. How Kubrick laid out the beginning of his film draws very close to the part in the Silmarillion, which dealt with the creation of the world. The piece Kubrick chose for the creation of the world sequence is now the iconic Also Sprock Zarathustra. Before this piece's first premiere, a short write-up by the composer Richard Strauss was put out to the public. It reads as follows. First movement, sunrise. Man feels the power of God. Andante religioso. But man still longs. He plunges into passion. Second movement, and finds no peace. He turns towards science and tries in vain to solve life's problems in a fugue. Third movement. The agreeable dance tunes sound and he becomes an individual. His soul soars upward while the world sinks far below him. The film 2001 follows this write-up almost identically from beginning to end. The connection between score and film drives even deeper. Richard Strauss admitted that the philosopher Nietzsche's piece of the same title influenced his composition. Nietzsche spoke of the figure Zarathustra, whom in Nietzsche's work was a god who provided humanity with the overman as an example. Without getting too detailed, Nietzsche drew his character from the real-life man Zoroaster, aka Zarathustra, who founded Zoroastrianism, which is an ancient religion of greater Iran. So it is plainly seen this film from the outset contains deeply religious symbolism. Creation has begun, but the image that is most symbolic is the sun. The duality of wordplay is apparent when John 1, 1 through 1-5 is read. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. This passage refers to Jesus Christ. So the sun in the opening sequence symbolizes God's son who was with him in the beginning of creation. Moving along to the next part of the phrase, from ancient times what is still to come, contains the dawn of man sequence, which shall be further discussed shortly along with the subsequent events. In the Dawn of Man sequence, the monolith appears to the hominids. Preceding the Jesus Christ figure of the film, aside from the aforementioned sun, is the monolith, a black three-dimensional rectangle. This object appears four times throughout the film, and each time is paramount. In order to understand the significance of its appearance, the symbolic value must be understood beginning with the Aristotelian theory. Aristotle wrote 12 books on the subject of metaphysics. His 12th and last book deals with the concept of an unmovable or a prime mover. This mover is itself not moved, but moves others through its actions. It is therefore impossible that in the same respect and in the same way a thing should be moved, both mover and moved, i.e. that it should move itself, said Aquinas. Aristotle is speaking of the monotheistic God. Through each part of the twelfth book, he slowly builds upon substance, cause, and ultimately the uncaused cause. Eventually, St. Thomas Aquinas further develops Aristotle's original thoughts with the five arguments, detailed in Summa Theologica, which are as follows. 1. Things exist, yet have the possibility to not exist. 2. Whatever exists has been caused to exist. 3. There cannot be an infinite number of causes to bring something into existence. 4. There must be an uncaused cause of all things. 5. The uncaused cause must be God. 
In better known terms, these five arguments are understood as the cosmological argument. St. Thomas bridges the pagan-Christian connection between God and Aristotle's theory. As stated, this is a theory, so this immovable mover is unknowable to humankind in the physical sense, but it transcends physicality. If said mover were to appear amidst the physical realm, it might materialize in the form of a monolith, like the one represented in 2001. The black rectangular object is completely simple, yet infinitely complex, containing within itself knowledge that cannot be seen nor truly understood. For to he an act of thinking, and to he an object of thought, are not the same thing, said Aristotle. How this monolith fits into the cosmological argument is by catalyzing events in the film. The entire film revolves, but truly depends, on the monolith, without which there is no motion picture. The first sequence the monolith appears in is the dawn of man. At the outset of the sequence, nothing noteworthy appears to be happening. Since this sequence takes place in the beginning, and early humanity is mostly living in harmony, a parallel can be drawn between their little utopia and the Garden of Eden. Of course these two places are vastly different based upon description, but on a basic level they are somewhat similar. So the hominids are living their life in relative harmony until the monolith simply materializes. When the hominids awake, everyone cowers before the object in reverence, perhaps fear, of God. The monolith brings with it the knowledge of good and evil, inciting the chain of events to transpire for the rest of the film. The monolith does not try to hide itself, but demands attention. The reason the monolith is made available for the hominids to interact with is because it is meeting them on their level. These hominid creatures can be seen as the utmost basic level of humanity. Intelligence is lacking among the hominids, so the first 12 minutes are uneventful since whatever lacks intelligence cannot move toward an end, unless it be directed by some being endowed with knowledge and intelligence, said Aquinas. Throughout the Old Testament, God meets the people on the level of their understanding, just as he does with people today. God is not bound by time, so he is able to transcend time, personalizing his experience to the given era. Since the monolith has met the hominids on their level, and they have chosen to see like God, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life, and eat and live forever. The last part of this verse is incorporated because of how the monolith deals with the humans later in the story. As the hominids decide to approach the monolith, a hushed silence falls. Since the monolith has made its presence known among them, a choir of ethereal voices has slowly been rising, beginning soft as to invite but magnifying to a fearful height the ethereal voices proclaim the powerful nature of the monolith, but also suggest an awakening, a realization. Soon the hominids are all touching the monolith, and at that moment their eyes were opened. In an extreme upward angle shot, it is as if the monolith is peering down at its subjects. The sun resides perched on top of the monolith, and the moon at the very top of the shot, forming a sequential order of how God is to make his presence known to creation. Father, Son, then Holy Spirit. A trinity is formed in this shot. In Aristotle's twelfth book over metaphysics, the number three crops up quite frequently. Aristotle talked about the existence of three types of substances, and later he states, Eudoxus supposed that the motion of the sun or of the moon involves in either case three spheres. This brings to mind the opening and closing shot of the film, where the camera pans over the moon to the earth and only glimpsing the sun, whereas the last shot is in reverse order, and I'll talk about that more later. The triune appears often throughout the film, by way of illusions of metaphysical symbols. After these subhuman creatures acquire a small amount of the nature of God, the monolith leaves them. 
The leaving of the monolith is much like when the Spirit of God left the presence of his creation. Remember, though, that Aristotle said, the final cause is some being for whose good an action is done. Aristotle's quote is hard to fit into the immediate context when the first major action a hominid performs is murdering another hominid, just as Cain murdered his brother Abel after their parents fell from the grace of God. Aquinas reminds us to keep the end in mind, another throwback to Isaiah 46.10. Although the beginning starts violently, seemingly breaking any hope for restoration, an intelligent being exists by whom all natural things are directed to their end, and this being we call God. Thousands, potentially millions of years after the presence of God has left from ancient times now to what is still to come, a bone falls to earth until a seamless jump cut shows it is no longer a bone but a weapon of the future. What began as one bone used for murder has magnified into one futuristic war machine with the capability to murder many, highlighting humanity's distancing from God and further reliance upon man-made science to solve their problems similar to Richard Strauss's write-up. The next monolith sighting is on the moon. Instead of being plainly revealed, the monolith has now been uncovered by digging under the moon's surface. It is noteworthy that the first monolith sighting was in a crater of sorts. Now the next sighting is in a man-made crater. Humans have evolved so they can dig into surfaces, whereas the hominids could not because of their primitive status. Once the humans come near the monolith, Ethereal voices rise, just like in the Dawn of Man sequence. A man reaches out to touch the monolith, just like the hominids did. Except for this encounter, there appears to be no fear in the humans, and through careful attention, the viewer can tell that wonderment has come over him. What makes this sighting of the monolith more intriguing than the previous one is that it was buried. Now the humans are actively seeking God because he has vacated his space among them. Originally, the monolith sought the creatures. Now the creatures are seeking the monolith because of the first argument that things exist. These events transpire. Since things exist, they have the active will to progress and further seek the causation of the remaining arguments. Because things can exist, they can also not exist. When the monolith disappears, it has supposedly ceased to exist. But since the humans exist, they have been given a cause to exist and that causes to seek a purpose higher than themselves. Once their technology advances to the point of finding a higher power, that higher power leads them somewhere else. In keeping with the five arguments, there cannot be an infinite number of causes, because the cause would not have a beginning, so it could not exist. Obviously, it is seen the monolith has a beginning. The argument can be made that it contradicts the second argument, that nothing can bring itself into existence. It does not contradict this argument, though. This is not understood till the end of the film, which leads into the next sighting of the monolith. A substantial character is introduced into the movie. Dave's introduction begins the line of humanity that will bring about the redemption of creation. His symbolic value is likely the most obvious the film contains. In the Old Testament, David was appointed to be king over God's people, the Israelites. Jesus Christ's earthly father, Joseph, was a descendant from the line of David. After the sighting on the moon, the humans have concluded the monolith put out a signal with coordinates leading to Jupiter. Dave arrives to the planet, witnessing the monolith orbiting Jupiter. The symbolism could not be more apparent. This scene blatantly expresses the Christian message of the film. In the Latin tongue, Jupiter, originally Lupiter, is a combination of Deu and Pater. Deus means Zeus, whereas Pater means father. So in terms of Roman mythology, the word Jupiter means Zeus' father. Applicable to Christianity, this reference means that Dave has journeyed to the father. Now is the right moment to introduce how the monolith, in literal terms, relates to the unmoved mover. There is no place in the film when the monolith moves on its own. In this scene, gravity is causing the monolith to orbit the planet. 
So the monolith is literally the unmoved mover, or the immovable mover, since it is always immobile in one fashion or the other. Traversing past the human realm only makes sense in order to reach a higher form of existence. So if Dave's mission is to reach God, he would need to supersede time as God does. Keeping in line with a third argument, there cannot be an infinite number of causes, or else the cause could not have existed in the first place. Now the heart of the film is at hand. The monolith has appeared three times thus far, and once not being seen for an innumerable amount of years. Undoubtedly, the monolith's erratic appearances and trail of breadcrumbs leads one to believe there is not an end to the number of causes the monolith is purposing. This is a very real aspect people feel today in their lives. The earth has existed for a long time, yet there seems to be an infinite number of reasons for its existence, but people can never come to a solid basis for a conclusion. Eventually, everyone reaches the end of their line, and that infinite number of causes is met. Keep in mind, once Dave has undergone his transition past infinity, he is existing outside of time, just like God. As Dave reaches the end, per se, of the infinity, he's met with a room decorated from a plethora of centuries, appearing not to be a style of any certain age. In Christianity, a concept of belief, accepted by some denominations but not all, is that of purgatory. Depending on the denomination, Purgatory holds different meanings. In this context, purgatory will be deemed a place of cleansing before entrance into heaven. So Dave's pre-entrance into heaven first consists of him undergoing purgatory. The whiteness of the room signifies a cleansing fire. Interestingly enough, the first room Dave enters is a bathroom, a cleansing room. Next, Dave enacts the verse, Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God knows me completely. Everything Dave has gone through is puzzling and imperfect. He is seen looking at himself in a mirror in his old age. Dave only understands partially, because his journey through purgatory is not yet done. While traversing through purgatory, he comes upon himself multiple times each at a different stage in his life. Dave is living his life simultaneously since he is beyond the infinity and thus above time. The second to last time Dave sees himself, he is eating his last meal, possibly symbolic of the Last Supper of Christ. This is the last time Dave, while living, will eat a meal. Accidentally, he knocks over a glass, bringing to mind, this is my body, which is broken for you. He then looks up, and sees himself laying in bed, near death, his body broken down by old age. God and man are signified in three ways in the next sequence. Ending his time in purgatory, Dave looks up, and he has come face to face with the monolith. First, this symbolizes that he has come face to face with God. The parallel between Dave lifting his finger towards the monolith is uncanny when comparing Michelangelo's painting of the creation of Adam on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Not only is the parallel the only symbolism, but it is also meant to call back to the dawn of man, when the hominids touch the monolith with fear. The TMA-1 sequence, when the man fearlessly touched the monolith, and now Dave reaches out in understanding. Firstly, the hominids do not understand, but only fear. Secondly, the fearless man thinks he understands, but does not. Now Dave has true understanding, in reverence and peace. In a way, this scene can be taken as Dave's death, yet Dave's inception. The Garden of Eden has been restored, whereas in the beginning of the film, the lowly hominids do not appear to have been created in the image of God due to their ineptness and desolate setting. This scene also embodies the restoration of man. Compare the opening setting with the current setting. Now Dave is in a beautiful place where he lived without want and need i.e. the food on the table and the luxury of the quarters. As Dave is finally restored, he transfigures into the star child. The three wise men said, We saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. The term transfiguration finds its place in the synoptic gospels of the New Testament. 
Dorothy Lee puts it absolutely beautifully and perfectly fits the text of the film when she said, In Christian teachings, the transfiguration is a pivotal moment, and the setting on the mountain is presented as the point where human nature meets God. The meeting place for the temporal and the eternal, with Jesus himself as the connecting point, acting as the bridge between heaven and earth. This is what the entire film has been about. Human nature has fallen, but the God who created it is drawing his creation back to himself. In this sequence, a bridge between heaven and earth has formed, and we are presented with the glory of God, his Son, Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ is the new Adam, then in this scenario, Dave would be considered Adam, and he would be replaced by the star child, also understood as Jesus Christ. The significance of the camera zooming into the monolith is to show the star child and monolith become one. It can also be taken as the star child being brought into the beginning of time, just as is written of Christ in John 1.1. 1, 1. St. Thomas Aquinas, the crafter of the five arguments, lists the transfiguration as the greatest miracle. Corresponding with miracles, in the Old Testament, the concept of Shekinah glory occurred in a few circumstances. The Shekinah was the presence of God among the people. Shekinah means he caused to dwell. Applied to the film, the monolith is the first causation. He, with the capital H, caused Dave to dwell in order for Dave to act as the voyager and the purpose of man to be restored to God. Since he, still with the capital H, caused Dave to dwell, he caused everything else in the film to dwell as well. Everything seen has been a chain reaction of causes created by the first cause, which was the monolith's presentation to the hominids. The hominids broke the link between God and man by choosing to be like God in the way of having the knowledge of good and evil and murdering a fellow hominid. The deaths occurred throughout the film displaying fallen humanity. Dave's voyage and eventual death can be taken as the link between God and man finally being restored at the end of time, but also the beginning of time. The star child is no longer shrouded, but glows brightly because we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. As the star child hovers above the earth, he is the restoring light of humanity. Remember that Dave's sequence in Purgatory consisted out of time since he had traversed past the infinity. Although the scene occurs at the end of the film, it can be considered as taking place before the Dawn of Man sequence, and actually the very beginning of the film. Consider the camera's point of view, consider the music, in John 1 14. Beginning with the point of view, it is now known the angle of the camera is opposite that of the beginning of the film, placing itself in the sun's point of view. Next, the score is exactly the same as the film's opening. Looking back on Richard Strauss's write-up for his Also Sprock Zarathustra piece, it is clear that how the write-up followed the film perfectly. Finally, the star child resides in the place of the sun, hovering over the earth, corresponding with the verse, and the word became flesh. As stated, the star child who represents Christ is featured in the end. To advocate Aristotle's metaphysics, the film depicts a continuous universe, and according to Aristotle, only that which is circular is continuous. So the first sequence in the film is the dawn of man, and the last sequence of the film is literally the dawn of man, being Jesus Christ. A triptych layer has been woven throughout the film, and a triptych pattern is important since what the monolith represents is a, is a three-layered god, while still being singular. In the book, the monolith occupies infinite space, yet only contains three dimensions. The number three crops up quite frequently in the film. There are only three sequences with title cards, so the dawn of man could be incorporated into the TMA1 sequence, because man is still dawning since they have not encountered the monolith yet, and have just come to a higher form than the hominids. Three sequences, three monoliths, three planets, three beings. Man, star child, and monolith. The film's core is built around the trinity. Just as the trinity is infinitely complex, so is this film. The simplest of things, though, are the most complex. The film's story structure is easily grasped along with the visuals. Each sequence is broken down, and the information presented is accomplished during each sequence. 
Long spaces of little dialogue with glorious music for the overall film create a magnificent work of art that is easily accessible from the surface, but the deeper reading is innumerable. The imagery that Kubrick creates rebounds upon itself, devising more and more concepts with each viewing. The genius behind barely any dialogue and more audio-visual is that it allows the viewer to find their own meaning and subtext within the film. Looking at 2001 through a Christian lens enables a striking story of man's quest for God to be seen. Ancient symbolism from non-believers to believers is given concrete form through this film. Aristotle and Aquinas' theories are present throughout time because they form the truth even if Kubrick did not purposely create a film depicting man's quest for God, the unmoved mover, and the birth of Jesus Christ, as humans we are created with inevitable truths, and we can only create within these truths.